Fidelio and Figaro were sort of paired studies. They were designed together and, and, and run together um, and, and completed not quite at the same time. Figo, Figaro finished a little bit later. But, but Fidelio was, well, both, both, both trials recruited a similar patient group with diabetes and, and kidney disease and at high cardiovascular risk. The Fidelio study sort of focused primarily on the kidney endpoint and the Figaro study focused predominantly on the cardiovascular endpoint. But both studies looked at the alternative endpoint. Um, and so it's very easy to put the two together and draw conclusions from a, from a bigger patient population. Um, but I think nephrologists like myself look more to Fidelio and cardiologists look more to Figaro. But actually, both trials you know, had similar endpoints um, and, and studied a similar patient population and had reasonably consistent results, I think it's fair to say. So I think the patient population that was studied, which is a patient population with type 2 diabetes and, and, and kidney disease, is a very high-risk population. These patients are at high risk of going on to get kidney failure and needing dialysis, and also at high risk of developing cardiovascular events um, along the way that, that may lead to, to, um, to, to premature death. So this is a very high-risk population. We haven't really had any therapeutic developments relevant to this population um, for over 20 years now. So the last you know, exciting trials were trials back in, um, published back in 2000, 2001, showing that angiotensin receptor blockers actually improved certainly kidney outcomes um, in, in this patient population. So we were desperately looking for new therapies. Um, and in the interim, um, SGLT2 inhibitors have come along. Um, and the SGLT2 inhibitors have actually proven to be um, a big hit in this population, uh, reducing both the cardiovascular risks and the kidney failure risks. And, and I sense that the development programs for the SGLT2s and the development programs for this, this non-steroidal um, mineral corticoid receptor antagonist were kind of developed at, at around the same time, but didn't take into account sort of the opposite drug, if you like. So we've really got now two new sets of data, a set of data on the SGLT2s in this population and a set of data on the non-steroidal MRAs, phenerenone, in this population. And we're not completely sure as to how to put these two sets of data together. Now, we do know that a small number of patients in the phenerenone studies were on SGLT2s, and we know that a small number of patients in the SGLT2 studies were on MRAs, not necessarily phenerenone, mainly spironolactone, which is, if you like, the older um, MRA that's been around for 50 years or so. So we, we have a little bit of data. Um, but the, the, the question now is, you know, can we put these two drugs together and get, you know, even, even greater benefit or, or synergistic benefits on cardiovascular and kidney outcomes? I think we can. I think the drugs work by different mechanisms and therefore logically the benefits should be additive um, or, or, or synergistic. So I think, I think we will um, be using these two drugs together. But, but we lack that sort of critical study of adding in the MRA to the SGLT2 or adding in the SGLT2 to the MRA. Um, and it's not clear whether we're going to get those studies anytime soon, um, particularly if we're expecting them to be driven by the, the, the pharmaceutical companies involved who've already put a lot of money um, in, into the, their development programs. Yeah, I mean, we tend to do that, I guess. We look at the, you know, the, the registries we've got of these patients. Um, the problem we have with those is that very because phenerenone is a relatively new drug, very few of the patients in these registries are going to be on um, phenerenone. They will be on spironolactone, and we can ex we can extrapolate from spironolactone data. Um, but people will argue that it's not quite the same drug. So the registries will be a little bit restrictive in terms of the amount of data we can get out of them. Um, you know, this may become the topic of a, or I hope it will become a topic of an academically led study, um, whereby, you know, the study is initiated by, by academics rather than, than by the pharma industry. But we will need support from pharma to do that because we need access to, you know, to drug and placebo. Well, it's an important area 
but it's we're going to be working in a sort of evidence free zone for a little while as we wait for further studies to come along um and yeah. and we probably do need to develop experience actually in in real world with the two drugs and and and, and assess you know the real world um the, the real world experiences of using these two drugs it's being marketed as as a new drug not a spironolactone brought into the 21st century um so we keep being told that it's a non-steroidal mineralocorticoid receptor antagonist and therefore it is a different drug and we're told that the fda has actually recognized it as a different class of drug to spironolactone and we're told that it has less it is less likely to cause hyperkalemia which is the big problem in this patient population, particularly as kidney function declines, and is the very reason we can't add spironolactone on to the existing ACEs and ARBs because we get a lot of hyperkalemia in this population. Now, we do know in the trials that there was an increased risk of hyperkalemia on the drug. It wasn't perhaps as big as we might have expected if we were using spironolactone, but it was still a problem. So the question then is, how can we ameliorate the hyperkalemia if we add in the SGLT2? Might that help us um, reduce the risk of hyperkalemia? Because um, SGLT2 certainly don't cause hyperkalemia. And there are some suggestions that they may help um, control potassium. So I, I think, again, we need that trial of combination therapy to see what the benefits are and what the risks are of, of the combination. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think to focus on the question, this is to us, this is a sort of newish class of drug um, that, you know, has come from um, new research um, and, you know, and, and, and new, a, new, a new molecule and, and isn't just spironolactone reborn in the 21st century.